we'll kick off this week's coaching corner. Thanks so much for um, joining us. We're um, really looking forward to a number of questions. Maybe you've got some at the end that you can uh, uh, give me for next week's inspiration. So the technology is just proving to be a challenge. Here we go. So uh, I've just popped up my contact details there. So if you do have some questions, you can um, send them through on Twitter or you can send them through on my email. And I do want to acknowledge the help and support from Philips who have been letting me play with their little Lumify machine. So there's a lot of uh, images of normal um, in amongst the talk tonight. And I have a number of um, victims that I play with, uh, namely husband and children, to try and get um, the different pictures of normal. So the Lumify has come in handy for grabbing some of those and to illustrate some of the um, technical scanning tips. So it's been a whole heap of fun uh, playing around with that. So um, the questions for tonight's session. First question is, I've learned how to find ureteric jets. How do I integrate this into the assessment of renal colic? Then we're going to look at how important is patient positioning when assessing the IVC. Often dysmic patients can't lie flat. And then last but not least is how to identify a bicuspid aortic valve accurately. So we're going to start with some ureteric jets. What is the clinical utility of you know, performing an examination and looking at the ureteric jets? So visualization of normal physiological of these ureteric jets is the normal physiological periodic efflux of urine from the distal end of the ureter. And it's thought that complete absence of one or both of the jets raises the possibility of an obstruction. On B mode, you can see a burst of low level echoes being emitted here from the right vesico ureteric junction and into the bladder. Now this, this picture that you can see is quite an exquisite example of it. It doesn't always show up so nicely like that, but um, it's one of those pictures that when you see it, you go, gosh, I've got to get a quick clip of that because it'll come in handy some stage. And then that's what that one was all about, really. So on colour, that jet of urine is of a high enough speed so that the frequency shift creates um, so that the, the speed of the urine going past the ultrasound creates a frequency shift and therefore you see a burst of colour. So here again is a right-sided ureteric jet. And you can see that uh, little burst of colour coming out there. So how, what is normal when we're looking at ureteric jets? Um, it's thought that we should be able to see two or more per minute. They should happen between two seconds and 150 seconds. There should be symmetry of the jet size. And, and some studies are sort of saying that, uh, that that ureteric jet should last for longer than six seconds in the normal patient. If you don't see all of that, is there some sort of partial obstruction? And is there a stone that is sort of blocking the flow of urine? So let's go cover a couple of technical things to start with. Um, it's really important that you get your B mode gain all set up nicely to start with. To get a good colour picture, you first have to have a really good 2D picture. So we want to make sure the gain is right uh, to optimise our chances of seeing that burst of colour. We want to then make sure that our depth and focus settings are good and we want to make sure that the colour sensitivity and the colour gain is set so that we optimise our chances of seeing the ureteric jet. So we have here the um, B-mode gain so you can see in this clip, um, winding the gain up and winding the gain down, you want to make sure that it's black enough so that you don't sort of fill in echoes in the background. So the, if it's too white, that represents artifactual echoes. And so um, the, the B mode imaging looks yuck, but also too, when you pop the colour on, you're going to decrease your chances of being able to see a really nice uh, colour picture as well. So we want to just make sure that the um, gain is set so that the fluid in the bladder is black. Um, so wind down the gain. 
On your um, CART systems, you've got um, any systems that have a TGC control. I would probably turn down the near field gain a little bit more in this one to get rid of uh, that near field reverberation artifact there. We want to make sure that the depth and focus are set correctly. So we want the bladder to fill the screen. So you can see here as I adjust the depth in real time, you want to make sure that the depth is set so that you can see a couple of extra centimetres behind your region of interest. Now on the handheld systems and some of the point of care systems that are available, getting your depth setting correct is crucial for making sure the focus is at the right place for for what you're looking at. Um, if you have on your cart system a focal zone, you need to set it at the back of the bladder here. Now the colour sensitivity and the colour gain is um, really important to get that set up correctly. So you can see in this clip here, first of all, the Um, over here. Now this is on the Philips Lumifier obviously and it's got two settings there, a fast flow setting and a slow flow setting. The fast flow, would, we would use that for things like um, the heart, carotid arteries, aorta, big, big vessels or big um, coloured areas and the slow flow you want to set for the smaller areas or for things that you're expecting to be um, low flow and the ureteric jet would be one of them. And what that does is it controls the um, colour, the, the sensitivity here. So you want, uh, on this one, you can see that it's nine centimetres per second, which is a really good sort of setup for the colour sensitivity when you're looking for ureteric jets. If that number was sitting up at 36 or 40 or something like that, the, the machine is set up to listen for blood flow that's going fast enough, like it's going through the carotids or through the heart or something like that. So you want to make sure that your colour sensitivity is set low and that that number is quite low so that you increase the chances of being able to see colour. Now, if we look at this clip, um, you can see here I've wound up the colour gain. And once you turn colour on, on, on pretty much any of your set, uh, on any of your machines, once you turn the colour on, the gain button that usually is the B mode gain now becomes the colour gain. So you can see here in this clip that I've wind it right up until it flares at me and then I turn it back down until that flash just disappears. And that means that I've optimised my um, colour settings for being able to see the ureteric jets here. So you can see on the side here, I'm just um, winding up the gain settings there and the number goes up and then winding it back. Now, when we're looking at ureteric jets, I'm gonna go out there with a couple of notes of caution. The first thing to think about is what is the hydration level of your patient? Now, in the interest of science, I have gone out and asked my family victims, can I, can I take some pictures of your um, bladder? So, I got my husband and two children to lie down on the bed and I scanned each one of them for about five minutes and none of them had any ureteric jets at all. And so I started to think, oh, wow, maybe, maybe it's the system, the point of care or the little handheld system isn't quite sensitive enough to see this. And, um, and I thought, oh, you know, it really should be. Anyway, um, they were all bursting full to go to the toilet. So uh, off they went. And then I started to have a look again half an hour later as their bladder filled up. And then all of a sudden, all three of them had lovely, lovely jets. So I'm not sure, um, I've seen this happen in clinical practice too. When people's bladder is really, really full, the frequency of the jets really goes down and you just don't see it. So I'm not sure if there's sort of some sort of pressure thing that stops the bladder from keep on filling at the same rate. I'm not sure. But when the bladder is full, you may not see the jets so easily. And likewise, if your patient is really, really dehydrated, you're not going to see the jets because obviously the rest of the body needs the water before it goes as excess to the bladder. So we'll have a look at this clip here. Um, again, family victim. We've got this first little tiny jet, little flash from both sides there. Left one, uh, the right one here is going on a little bit longer. And then you can see, it goes on for a little while, this, this video clip. Um, you can see that there's a period nothing happens. Now in this sort of time, staying still and holding your probe very still so that you know you're on the area where the jets are going to come up is, can be quite challenging. 
even with very cooperative patients. And if we wait long enough, it, um, the, the jet will come again. And there is one coming soon from the right first. But you can see that there is quite a bit of time. Now, this feels like a long time. There it goes. One from the right. And then there's another little baby one coming from the left in a minute. Um, this feels like a long time when we're watching it right now, but I'm sure if you're in an emergency department and you've got a lot of patients waiting for you, sitting here waiting for these jets to happen can seem quite tedious. And so, you know, the temptation is to cut the examination short so that you, because you just don't have time to wait for it. Um, and again, here's another little one just there. Now, some of the articles that I was looking at was saying that if there is asymmetry of the jets, then that might represent a partial obstruction. So, you know, if you, if you hang your hat 100% on the fact that you can't see ureteric jet, so it must mean that there's a stone or some sort of obstruction, then all three members of my family had an obstruction when their bladder was full. Um, and then if you kind of look at it and go, well, those jets weren't perfectly symmetrical. So does that mean there's a partial obstruction on the left-hand side here or in the right? So again, it has to come back to the clinical context. This is a normal patient. So those, those, that asymmetry in the jets doesn't really stand for anything. Um, so if we look at these, just to point out that, that's the right one and the left one is coming. So they can be quite different on that on that loop the first time we saw them go they both were about the same size and you know i think just different amounts fill up at different rates could this actually reflect that one kidney is working better than the other you wouldn't know in this clinical context with a perfectly normal patient i just think it's a normal variant now when i looked up some of the um uh, literature on this the uh, what's his name uh, sean delaire did a did a study and he was looking at the clinical utility utility of ureteral jets and uh, and the disparate opinion about these so what he did was this study where he had a couple of research questions he took those questions to a radiology group and to a group, bunch of urologists so there was about equal responses from both the radiology group and the urology group the first question was how how often do you evaluate the ureteric jets in your routine practice? And the radiologists did it about half the time and the urologists did it about a third of the time. And the next question was, do you think that these are useful and have any sort of clinical use? The radiologists seemed to think that they were somewhat useful and the urologists said they were completely irrelevant. And the conclusion of this study was that reporting JEPs doesn't really impact clinical management at all. One of the other things that they commented on was that to evaluate the ureteric JEPs as normal, it required a minimum scan time of 10 minutes. And so you have to ask the question, what is the return on your investment in time here? What is the cost of that time? in a busy sort of emergency setting or any sort of setting, if, if the results are not really helpful and there are so many different things that can make those results variable anyway. So, you know, what if there's just a little stone and it partially obstructs? Is that giving me that asymmetrical size jet or, or is it because it's not hydrated or is it indeed because that kidney is not working as well as it should and so we don't see uh, a ureteric jet because that kidney is not making urine. There's so many, you know, complicating factors here that I think that um, to hang your hat on it and go, this is absolutely vital is, um, and, and that that completely rules it out, um, is a bit risky. So in summary, there's a whole lot of debate about the clinical utility. And I question whether this is really a point of care examination um, because the time taken to actually prove that those jets aren't there, a minimum scan time of 10 minutes, staying in the same spot, even in the best of circumstances to uh, get that ureteric jet can be quite tricky. You don't have to move your probe position very much and all of a sudden you're off, off the area where that jet is. Um, and so with all those caveats, you know, is it really useful? I don't know. I, I think that if you see them, it probably excludes it quite easily. And if you see them, quickly and easily, that's great. But just because you don't see them, I don't think that that um, actually 
helps us much or, or gives us that more much more information. And the thing about this is that with the CAT scan being having such a high sensitivity and specificity for locating uh, kidney stones wherever they are along the tract, um, would you really count on this? And I don't know that I would. So I'm going to just pause for a minute. What do you reckon, Jono? Do you, do you still want to use the ureteric jets? Uh, you, um, you're making me doubtful that it's a useful part of the exam. I guess you could, I guess you could say if you see them, it rules out a complete obstruction in that ureter. Yeah. That's probably the most useful um, thing you could say about it. Beyond that, it all seems a little wishy-washy. Yeah, I, I'd agree. It's I, I like I like doing it because it's nice to see it and you get a lovely flash and it's kind of fun. Um, but I don't hang around for a long time trying to prove it because it's just so much variability in normal. You know, if the kidney functions off a little bit, you'll see nothing. If you haven't got your settings on your machine correct, you know, you, um, you're asking the question, is this the patient or is this my settings? So you have to actually know how to use the colour Doppler well to be able to count on it. Um, what do you reckon, Jenny? Would you agree with that? Yeah, no, absolutely. But I think, um, like, it's probably worthwhile using it occasionally just so you do know your colour settings and your positioning. So, and trying it, and if you do use it and... You can see a nice colour jet, well, fine, you know, you've got that. But as you say, you don't have the time, so don't hang around. But, you know, you need to practice that to make sure you know the settings and to know exactly what level to look at. So, yeah. yeah cool. I was reassured, though, because, um, you know, when I first scanned Mike and the kids, I saw nothing and I was thinking, is, this, is it just the sensitivity on the handheld or am I just not used to using this and, I'm, you know, I've always done this on a on a high end imaging system rather than the handhelds. And then uh, it turns out everyone goes to the toilets. There's nothing wrong with the sensitivity. It picks it up absolutely fine. Um, it was just their bladders full and it wasn't happening. And I got a sore arm sitting there waiting to try to see these jets. So Joanne, yeah, is it is it ten minutes that you're meant to spend purely on the ureteric jets? 10 minutes to exclude a it, a minimum of, of, of 10 minutes, they were saying. Some, some of the, one article said five minutes. Um, th this particular article, the Del Air article, was uh, looking at the radiologists and the urologists, and, and they said 10 minutes as a minimum scan time before you could exclude it. So what's the cost of the time? But I guess you could be lucky and you'll see both jets in the first 30 seconds and then you've answered your question. But, yeah. Yeah, it's if you don't see it, I think. Yeah, that, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, left wondering. Mm, cool. Any other comments? All right. Well, we'll move on to the next question. So, um, you can see the screen again? Yeah, we've got the summary up. Um, here we go. All right, so our next question was regarding IVC assessment, and in particular, what is the effect of patient positioning on the IVC? Because dyspneic patients can't always lie flat. So, um, IVC assessment, if we just refresh some of the background here, um, IVC, measuring the IVC or, or evaluating the IVC is good for three different purposes. The first one is in diagnosis. So we're looking to investigate whether our patient is volume depleted, in, as is the case in hemorrhagic shock or dehydration, or if they are volume overloaded, so as a result of congestive heart failure, for example. The second way we might look at this is for serial monitoring. So looking at monitoring of volume status in a patient with sepsis. So what you do here is repeat the measurement after each fluid bolus. And the third way that we can use the IBC assessment is to predict volume responsiveness. So essentially, if the IVC is looking really, really flat, you can afford to give them some fluids and if the IVC is really, really distended, you'd be 
wondering whether giving them fluids is the best thing. And people are starting to use that IVC, looking at the IVC and looking at the lungs to see if the lungs are wet um, to, to assess whether giving the fluids is going to cause more harm than good. So, so first of all, I thought I'd start with a couple of technical tips. My first one is don't don't rotate on the IVC coming from that subcostal four chamber. And I think the thing that we see when we're teaching people at our training headquarters in Melbourne here, the, the biggest problem that I see people struggling with is they start with a subcostal four chamber view with the probe in the transverse orientation. And then they want to rotate on it so that they can see the IVC coming from the right ventricle. The problem is though, is that you, uh, people start to see the IVC coming up and then they just stop rotating. They're very oblique on the IVC and they don't get a full length view of the IVC. And they kind of get lost in the meantime as they're rotating the probe. So I don't tend to teach it that way because I've just seen so many people and, and particularly novice users that really struggle with getting the view in this manner. So what I suggest instead is everyone knows how to find the aorta. Um, so find your aorta, you know that the IVC runs parallel with the aorta and it's just to the right in the normal patient. So if you find the aorta, then you just tilt your probe a little bit to the patient's right. Now the advantage of doing it this way is that the aorta is always gonna be distended unless your patient is deceased or something. Um, you'll always see a big vessel in the aorta. Whereas the IVC, depending on how much pressure you have on, it might be uh, a bit collapsed because the patient's dehydrated or underfilled, or you're pushing a little bit hard and so you can't see it. And so then it all gets really, really confusing. And you want to be able to make sure that you are truly looking at the aorta or the IVC and not getting them confused. The other thing about the IVC is that it does undergo respiratory phasicity and it changes its diameter in response to breathing and in response to lots of things. So it is a constantly sort of moving feast. Um, you don't want to be calling the aorta the IVC and, and completely missing it. So if you always just check where the aorta is and then tip your probe to the towards the patient's right to confirm that you're actually on the IVC. You know, if that fails, maybe try this rotating from the subcostal view, but the the most of the people that I've seen when they're doing that, they just get really, really lost. Now, the other big tip is to keep the heart on the screen. So you want to make sure that you have your probe pointed up to the patient's head enough so that you've got the diameter, uh, the diaphragm on the edge of the on the edge of the screen, and you can see a bit of the heartbeat on the edge of the screen. If you're pointing your probe to the bed, um, you're missing the proximal part of the aorta. So I'll just illustrate a couple of these points here. These two Nerf bullets represent the two tubes that are the IVC and the aorta. If you find the, IV, uh, the aorta first and then just tip your probe to the right, they're that close, it doesn't take much of a tip. If you tip your probe to the right, you'll find the IVC right next to it. Here is a real life picture of that. We're on IVC, we've gone to aorta and then back to IVC. So as this loop plays again, IVC, we come over here, here's the aorta and here's the IVC. Now you can see that I have the probe tilted up and up. I can just see the heart wriggling on the, on the edge of the screen there. So we need to keep the heart on the edge of the screen so that we know that we're high enough and we are seeing where the, aorta, uh, where the IVC actually comes into the right ventricle. The other uh, problem is if you start too low and you point your probe to the bed in this fashion and you haven't got enough upwards tilt. So you need to point the probe up towards the patient's chin there to be able to see that proximal part of the IVC. Here's that movement on a real patient. As we rock, we can see more of heart. If we rock down, we see more of the abdominal part of the IVC. So rocking up, and we see the heart there. Now, 
In the interest of science, once again, and with three willing victims in my house, I did a little bit of an experiment. Um, and because I could, I've got the machine at home and I thought, I just want to prove a point here. And it didn't quite go as well as I expected. So I took pictures and measured the, uh, the IVC on two victims in my house. Um, for each patient, um, I measured the IVC in, at the confluence of the hepatic vessels and I measured them in supine with quiet respiration. I then did a valsalva maneuver. I said, take a big deep breath in and hold it. And then I looked and measured again when they were standing erect. So this is uh, patient A is a 14 year old and patient B is an eight year old. So there is a bit of a size discrepancy here that's probably due to age. But um, I'm gonna look at patient A to start with. In the supine position, her IVC measured two centimeters. We did Valsalva and it predictably decreased in size. And then I said, take a deep breath. And I was expecting that it would increase in size and it didn't really. And then when she was erect um, and standing up, it decreased in size. Now that might be because the fluid heads south, I don't know, is a 0.8 centimeter difference in size statistically significant it may be it may not when i measured her ivc when she was in the erect position it still looked well filled so you know if this patient was uh, coming in because they are in shock for whatever reason um you know there'd be you'd have room to give some fluids it wasn't super distended but it wasn't flat either if we look at patient B, supine quiet respiration, 1.34 centimetres. The Valsalva manoeuvre, it did decrease in size. Uh, on inspiration, it sort of went back to the original size, give or take a squeak there. And then when he stood up, it actually got bigger. So on this very, very small sample, admittedly, I'm like, oh, these are really, really confounding results. But in actual fact, I think, that's pretty much what happens out there in the real world. It's a highly variable um, sized vessel uh, and it depends. So when I uh, had a look at the literature, there, there was you know, some squabbling. It's like, where do, you move, where do you measure the IVC to start with? Because it collapses non-uniformly, do we measure it at the diaphragm, at the right at the hepatic confluence there? I've heard of some articles that say, you know, measure it about a one centimetre below the hepatic confluence. So there's no real standard agreement about exactly where you should measure it. There's no agreement about the how either. You could measure it in trans, you could measure it in long. Do you measure it on inspiration or expiration? You could have different probe positions. The standard approach is a long view in the sub position, but other approaches were described as a mid-axillary long position as well. And then, you know, the sniff test, which I saw one particular um, description, it's a good party trick, and it is, it's nice. You can see that it collapses, um, but is it clinically useful? I don't know, it's doubtful. I guess the thing here is on the patients where you are evaluating the IVC because you're asking about fluid, uh, fluid vol or volume responsiveness, are they the sort of patients that you can ask and that they can cooperate with breathing in and breathing out or that they could perform a sniff test for you? Um, some of the literature was saying uh, ventilated patients, at least there's some consistency, but then if you've got positive or the PEEP stuff happening, then you haven't got the you know, then you've got a distended sort of aorta or a collapsed aorta, at RVC, I should say, um, the, the measurements are all skewed anyway. So the advice in those situations is to turn off the PEEP and then measure the IVC. So uh, Nova Panabianco and her uh, group wrote an article on the effects of supine versus upright positioning on inferior ve vena cava measurements. And their conclusions were the IVC metrics do not change significantly based on patient position. 
For those patients who are unable to lay completely supine, a semi-upright measurement of the IVC for volume status may be an accurate alternative. And their sample size was a lot bigger than my two. <laughs> so I guess the take home points here are, you need to remember to be a doctor and the clinical context is important. I have seen a lot of patients that come in and be our standardized patient models for training and they often have really, really collapsed RVCs. And so if, if this patient was presenting and you were strictly using a really collapsed IVC as an indicator of volume depletion, then, you know, all these people would be really sick and, and need to go home and drink or need a, a, some fluids given. But that's not the case. They've come in, they're normal, they're healthy volunteers, and they just have a collapsed aorta. I've questioned them at times and said, have you been drinking much this morning? I don't think it makes any difference. So the key question, the key take home here is you need to be a doctor first and that clinical context is really important. And the last thing is, is that IVC measurement is probably helpful at the extreme. So if it's really flat, you can probably give fluids. And if it's really distended, you'd think twice about giving fluids. You might also just take a look at the lungs and see if they're wet. But at the extremes, it might be helpful. But anywhere in between, I'm, I'm dubious. And certainly, I know there was a table of, you know, if, the, if it measures this, it reflects a right heart pressure of X. And I just think that's dodgy personally. Um, and I know that there's a lot of debate about this in clinical circles. So does anyone have any comments, questions about that? That's amazing, Sue Ann. You've gone away and done like a triple blinded randomized control trial to answer my question. That's great. Um, <laughs> I've got a machine at home, Jono. It's, uh, it's, and it's curious. I'm just trying to get some pictures to illustrate normal because it's easy to find pathology on the internet and and uh -huh. or in our in you know we've collected cases of abnormal but often finding normal is is a little bit trickier so <laughs> I, I guess you know i was i guess i'm thinking if someone is um supine their anterior abdomen abdominal contents might sort of press down and squash the ivc but then also if they then stand up all that um fluid is going to pull in their legs and that would also squash the IVC. So it's not really a, a clear cut um, one direction or the other, is it? No, and, and when I measured the 14 year old, she stood up and hers got bigger. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense. And the eight year old, he stood up and he, no, yeah, he stood up and he's got smaller. So it was, it's kind of like, there wasn't even any consistency there. Um, neither of them have significant uh, abdominal contents to compress too much at all. It must be said they are quite um, perfect samples, sort of thing. <laughs> not not representative at all of the of your average sick patient in the ED at all. But it was interesting. And Sue Ann, I think as you said that it's not a matter of just doing IVC alone. It's IVC in conjunction with heart and lungs. Um, yeah before you, you know, to think about, are you using this and how relevant is it? Have a look at the heart, have a look at the lungs, what's going on there in both of those. Yeah, that's a good point. Any other questions? I see we've got a few extras who've joined the call. Hello to Kian and Olivia and Bianca. Hi there. Hi Kian, how are you going? Good, 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 good. Does anyone have any other questions on the IVC? Uh, no, so Anne, but that was a very interesting um, with, with your children. And um, yeah, as you said, I think you made good points about um, you have to look at the clinical reasons and to get a doctor to clinically evaluate for sure. Yeah. All right, well, I'll move on to our last topic. which is the bicuspid aortic valve. Now, I do have to admit, Jono sent me this question as well. Thank you, Jono. And I looked at it and I went, oh, really? Do I, oh. The, the aortic valve is my arch nemesis view. And, and particularly a bicuspid aortic valve. 
So I'm going to just state here, I am a general trained sonographer that's learned how to do point of care echo, which mostly involves B mode assessment of the heart. It, it's not, I can't do any of the fancy measurements and stuff. So um, I, I thought, okay, I am going to tackle this question because I myself have actually really, really struggled with getting this view. And so I'm going to take you on my journey here. So the question was, how do I identify a bicuspid aortic valve accurately? So I'm going to kind of put it out there. Is this even a point of care type question? So one to 2% of the population have congenitally bicuspid valves. And I have particular um, experience of this personally insofar as Mike had, my husband had a bicuspid aortic valve that suddenly failed. So it's from very um, personal experience that this is, and maybe that's why it's my arch nemesis as well. But when he collapsed at school, picking up the kids, he was then taken off to the hospital in the ambulance. The paramedics had forwarded his um, ECG trace to the hospital. They knew on arrival at the hospital that he was in acute heart failure. And we kind of bypassed the emergency department altogether and went straight up to the cardiac cath lab where he had a formal echo done. But I think this illustrates the point that if it is a bicuspid aortic valve that is presenting in an acute presentation like that, in the ED, you're probably going to be finding a whole lot of other things that are going to ring alarm bells for you, even if you missed the bicuspid aortic valve. Because I think, I actually think that for a general trained sonographer, I'm sure the echo sonographers are very, very good at this, but I find this really difficult to go 100%. Yep, that is. I just haven't seen enough numbers. Um, and Mike's had his fix now, so, um, you know, I can't practice. So um, in Mike's case, if uh, when I looked at the cardiac exam afterwards, and I'm glad I didn't see it at the time, but his left ventricle was enormous. So there was other things that would have alerted you that something's going wrong, even if you didn't necessarily put it down to it's because it's a bicuspid valve. So I guess my experience in trying to get a handle on the aortic valve is that my biggest problem is image acquisition and, and the reliability of being able to just take a nice picture of the aortic valve. And the way I tackled that and continue to practice is, you know, I was at a conference in America, they had a whole heap of very nice physically shaped medical students that presented no barrier to imaging. They had glass windows of the chest. And so I, I just practiced again and again and again. I went around and did an aortic valve view on every single patient. And I, and I just kept repeating it to try to figure out what were my hand movements to get that. So the repetitive practice on normal is really, really important because if you recognize normal, then abnormal will often stand out more. The other thing is just the pattern recognition. And so the repetitive practice helps, but it's also just recognizing what does normal look like. A lot of ultrasound is about teaching you to know what normal looks like so that abnormal stands out. And if you don't know what the abnormal is, you can figure it out later. But in recognizing that something is abnormal, that you need help, you need to refer it on for formal studies. So for pattern recognition, the way I practice is to get onto Google, type in bicuspid aortic valve or ultrasound and flick through lots and lots of pictures. Um, there's a couple of really good websites. I've sourced the pathology pictures today from Echopedia. Uh, his, there's a, a German cardiologist who's put together an amazing resource of just heaps and heaps of echo cases. So I've been able to grab some of those cases for examples to show you what this looks like today. So I'm going to start with normal. Again, this is just on the Lumify. It's not the, it's not a high-end CART system. This is on the handheld Lumify and on my willing victims at home, which are now the kids because the adult has his already fixed and it's not normal anymore. So on the left here, we've got a normal parasternal long view and on the right, a normal short axis view of the aortic valve. In the short axis view, we're looking at, that's the most reliable for being able to actually 
see the pathology, not the effects of the pathology so much, but to see the actual bicuspid nature of the valve. That's a, it requires a short axis view. And we look for the Mercedes sign that's turned upside down. So again, here's, here's a normal parasternal short axis view of the aortic valve with that Mercedes sign. If we're looking at a bicuspid aortic valve, so I have the normal one on the left here, and here's the bicuspid view. You often get an asymmetry of the valve leaflet. So the right-sided one here is bigger than the left-sided one. Uh, the nature of this pathology, they'll get um, thickened leaflets, you'll get regurgitation, um, lots of other signs to look for as well. You can also get bicuspid valves that have RAFE. Now, I think this is really hard because on first glance to me, that looks very similar to, and I've got a picture coming up where I compare it with the normal, but that, that could be easily mistaken by you know, people that haven't got years and years of experience. I'm sure the echo techs look at that and go, oh no, that's bicuspid with RAFE. But uh, you know, I'm looking at that thinking it looks very, very similar to a normal valve. And here's the bicuspid valve again. So both of these are abnormal valves. If I look at that one here and compare it against a normal, you can start to see that, for me, it looks a bit clover leaf, but um, you can start to see that there is asymmetry of that valve. And the rafe is like a, a sort of where it's almost, um, I'm trying to think, melted together. I've lost the words, but they, it's conjoined there a little bit on that right side. So the things that we need to look for, in the parasternal long axis view, uh, you can look for doming of the valve leaflets. It often comes with dilatation of the aortic root. And if you pop the colour on, you'll see regurgitation on, on colour Doppler. In the parasternal long axis, the normal view is the Mercedes sign. So if it doesn't look like a Mercedes sign, then something's going on. And you can also look at regurgitation on colour. So here's an example of a bicuspid valve in long. And if I'm looking at that, to me, it looks reasonably normal. Maybe the, maybe the aortic root is a bit dilated. Certainly that the, those valve leaflets are a little bit thickened and are not as clean as the normal case. But there's nothing else that just goes, screams out at me that says, oh, wow, yeah, that's definitely bicuspid. So in the long axis view, it's a little bit trickier. But here's an example where you have dilatation of the aortic root and the doming, where you get the, the valve leaflets, instead of coming together quite straight, they kind of dome out this way. So here again, on the left, here's a normal long axis view to look at what those valve leaflets are doing. And on the right, you can see the doming of the valve leaflets there. Now, I'm not the best at colour Doppler for the heart, I have to say. As I said, I'm general trained. I can do B mode cardiac, but I did pop the colour on here to get a, an example of normal. I don't know if it's optimised as well as it should be, but um, what it does show me is that there is only there's no colour when the leaflets are closed. So there's no regurgitant jet here. We have an example on the right of a small regurgitant jet on this abnormal valve. So you can see that blue-green fl flame here. And again, we've got normal on the left. And here's a case of more extreme regurgitation. So you get that colour aliasing, high-speed velocity blood that's coming the wrong way at the wrong part of the cycle here. So you've got blood going across the valve in all parts of the cycle. You can see on the normal one that it, it, there's blood there and then it, when the valves close, there is no regurgitation. So the valve is doing its job. On the apical four chamber view, you're looking for regurgitant jets and you can see that regurgitant jet, it's, it's very turbulent um, and the speeds are higher so you get the, the flame of different colours there and the green in this case indicates higher speed velocity flow. And here's a more extreme example. There's blood going every which way in this heart. 
so in summary, I'm going to kind of put it out there. I don't, I don't know that this is necessarily the scope of a point of care study. Um, it's nice to have if, if, if you've had lots and lots of experience, you might start to recognise this. But I don't think it's the job of a point of care study in the emergency room to find out all the ins and outs of the heart pathology. I think the job in the emergency room is to say, this is a normal heart or it's abnormal. And it's the grossly abnormal ones that you need to do something about. The other, the other thing that I'd say is that scanning the aortic valve, it's not as easy as it looks. The echo sonographers make this look really easy and they can do a hundred different views and, and get really lovely pictures, but it's not as easy as it looks. So I certainly still struggle getting the aortic valve. As I said, it's my arch nemesis view in the body. Um, it, it's tricky to get a good picture. You need to practice, 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 practice on lots of normals first and to set your sort of benchmark for here's what normal looks like for two reasons. The first is so that then abnormal stands out at you. But the second is so that you build a confidence that if you can't get a good picture, you realise that it may not necessarily just because of your skills. It could be because of the patient or some circumstance with the patient that means you're not getting a good view. And the third point is you need to do lots and lots and lots and lots of these to be able to reliably detect it. So um, the, it's an experience thing. I'm sure when you've done hundreds of cases of echo, it starts to be really, really obvious when there's a bicuspid valve. But uh, as a point of care study, uh, I don't know. I don't reckon it's necessarily um, in the scope there. Does anyone strongly agree or disagree with those comments? Does that answer your question, Jono? Yeah, you know, I feel very selfish. I've been the one asking all the questions tonight and it's been great. Um, right. Um, but yeah, I guess I think you're right. You know, it's not the most important piece of information to find out uh, in the acute setting. Maybe it, you could correlate, sort of tie it in with a dilated left ventricle or aorta or some aortic regurg that you'd seen, but yeah, it's not the most important piece of information, is it? And looking at all those pictures there, it's reminded me, yes, if you if you can get a wonderful, pristine image and you see a nice, crisp Mercedes sign, maybe you could confidently say it's a tricuspid valve. But if your images aren't as beautiful as those ones that you showed, maybe you shouldn't um, uh, really confidently say that it's tri-leaflet when you're not really sure. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sue Amazing. That's all right. I, I looked at that um, bicuspid with Rafe and the the normal, and um, it's subtle for me, who I'm not a, a trained echo sonographer. You look at that and you kind of go, oh, all right, if I look at them side by side, I can see that that one isn't quite right. Um, but if I had only looked at that bicuspid one with the Rafe, I'd probably go, yeah, that looks tricuspid to me and, and get it really wrong. So, but again, I'm... I haven't done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of echoes and most of my echoes have been on relatively um, well patients um, and easier patients, not, not the crashing ones. But for the patient that is coming in and has, like in Mike's case, he came in with acute heart failure because his bicuspid valve gave up the ghost. Um, there's a whole lot of other pathologies that you'd see, like you'd see the massive left ventricle. You wouldn't have been able to miss that. You know, there's other things that would show that might start, you know, triggering the memory cells and going, Oh, maybe it's because of this. There's other things that add into that picture. What about is Kian still on the call? No, I was going to say if I um, had many, he had scanned. Olivia, whereabouts uh, are you practicing? And what sort of doctoring are you doing? Uh, I'm a sonographer. Not oh, a there you go. Are you a cardiac <laughs> sonographer? No, general. Oh, phew. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to critique at all. But it's really interesting, like, um, you know, seeing the cardiac side and understanding it a bit more because you get asked a lot of, um, you know, uh, echo questions, which you're, you have no idea what you're looking at or talking about. And also um, the Echopedia website i had no idea about that so that's pretty oh, it's cool. an amazing resource amazing resource yeah. um yeah. i think the i always used to wonder as a sonographer um i think why do we take two years to learn the whole body and the 
air coastenographers take two years just to learn the heart. And then you start doing cardiac snap ultrasound and then you know why. <laughs> it's really hard and there's lots physiologically that goes on and it's a really tricky exam. So um, I think the point of care exam answering those big questions is, is, is where we need to sort of stick stick to the script because anything that's a little bit more nuanced should be getting referred for a formal echo. And I think, as you said, Sue Ann, that often that short axis view of aortic valve is, you know, is often a difficult one to get and we don't always get it in the short axis. So yeah, um, obviously there's going to be times that you're not even seeing it in the short axis and you really need to see it in the short axis to call it. I always have a little internal party when I can see it and sometimes it's not so internal, but if I get a good valve view, I always feel quite chuffed. Um, it's still my arch nemesis view. <laughs> I guess that's all the uh, questions that we had time for tonight. I was wondering, does anyone have any questions that they'd like to put on the rotor for next week? These are some of the, um, the leftover questions that we didn't quite get a uh, chance for this week. Um, spectral droplet, how, when and why um, in the ED? When would you use it? How do you use it? Why would you use it? Another question was finding the ovaries and how do you assess for flow in torsion transabdominally? I was just going to say, no, you don't. It's a transvaginal exam, but I'm going to go into a bit more detail with that one next time. Um, and some tips and tricks to finding the bile duct. So if anyone has any other questions that they'd like to add, please feel free to get in touch with me either on the ZDo Now uh, hashtag with Twitter, on my personal one at I underscore C underscore sound, or email us at the admin address where you would have um, got your, uh, mail, uh, your sign in for tonight's session. But again, I'd like to say thanks to Philip Phillips for uh, supporting this event and to let me play with their machine because I'm having a whole lot of fun with it at the moment. It's really cool. Has anyone else thought of any questions in the meantime? No, it sounds like save ourselves for spectral Doppler next week, Sue Ann. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> cool. All right then. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I hope that that's been helpful and I uh, hope to see you again next week. Thank you so much, Sue Ann. That was great. Fantastic. Okay. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Sue Ann. Thank you. See you next week. See you next week.